Uh, now we have quite some time to questions, and please be reminded that we had a session before the coffee break as well, and two presenters from there have asked questions from them as well. Uh, please raise your hand to see that you want to uh, ask a question. I'll try to keep the, keep the order in how the hands are raised, thanks, and you, you, can, you can continue to, to, to weigh me, then, then I'll put your, put your name down. Um, thanks, thanks, thanks. I think I've, I've, I've collected you here. Uh, uh, the first question goes to Professor Massimo Latorre, please. Mike, we have so many times already discussed that. But you know, uh, listening you, uh, which is always a pleasure and very interesting and enriching. Thank you very much for your paper. So I, I, I learn and um, uh, so thank you very much. Listening, you reminded me you know, in a very evocative way a, 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 a film, a movie that I've recently seen with admiration, although with some problem, problems. And this is 19. 17. You know, since 1917, this Samuel Mendes, so this, there are these um, uh, two uh, British soldiers, they have this mission, and then, and at the end of the movie, they found, after many adventures and many tragedies, they found a group of British soldiers preparing for battle and wonderfully singing. You remember this scene? Have you seen the movie? Okay. Remind, wonderfully singing. Now, I, I saw you there singing. You understand? Because if this is true, and if your, your, your narrative is true, is true, and if the values you are defending are true, we are back 1917. And you should prepare to sing before attacking the Germans, because the Germans are seen a very, very bad people. They are so bad. In the, in the movie, they, say they are all uh, criminals and really nasty, na nasty, nasty subjects. So I think what you have presented to us is not a story, is not either a story, is a parable. And it, it, you know, it's, what is, a parable for what? I have the impression that you don't know for what. You understand? You don't know. You don't know where you're going. I would also say that there are mistakes in the, in, the, in the narrative. There are many mistakes. And the one the fundamental mistake is this one. It is not true that the, from the beginning, historical true, the European integration started as a neoliberal project or even as an ordo-liberal project. Uh, the ordo-liberal, the neoliberal, came afterwards. And then you might be right, or you are right. There is a moment in the evolution, I would say, single European act, 1987. Then something, and some jurisdiction, of course, the European, very, Cassis de Dijon, 1979. So something changes, and this will be producing, because of, together with other reasons, the Treaty of Maastricht, and so on, and so on, and so on. But, so, you are, you are right in some respects. I'm not saying that you are not right. You know, I'm not saying that there is a strong order liberal machine with the, without the European integration process. There is. But not from the beginning, it's not, you know, from the beginning it was, no, the story is much more complex. And in the, from the beginning, there was also a social democratic idea. And the Christian Democrats that were absolutely important, they were all in 1950, 51, the Treaty of Paris for the European Community of Steel and Coal. There were Christian Democrats there doing this. They were not ordo liberals, Mike. They were not. So, and also in 57, in, SPAC was not an ordo-liberal. The Gasperi was not an ordo-liberal. 
And in 57, even Martino, who was a liberal, but not <laughs> ordo liberal, even Gaetano Martino was an Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs. So the story is much more complex. The one dimensional man you mentioned is a criticism not of neoliberalism, it's a criticism of social democracy, it's a criticism of welfare state. Habermas at the end of the 70s, the, the enemy, because they saw the colonization of social life, was not neoliberalism, it was social democracy. Perhaps they were wrong, perhaps they were wrong. So I think the, the story is very complex. We shouldn't make it simple because otherwise we'll be there on the shore river singing before the attack. Thank you. I mean, uh, I'm not sure whether, whether, whether either you were, you were listening or r really taking seriously what I was saying. But of course, I mean, of course this is complex. This is a, this is a, a book that takes 250 pages to explain and which will be published in the summer by Oxford University Press so you can read it. And when one is condensing this kind of argument into half an hour, then of course you have to make shortcuts. But the idea that order liberalism doesn't have an impact on uh, European integration from an early stage is simply, is simply false. I mean, this, is, this has been documented by, by, by so many uh, uh, scholars. Um, now, yes, it, it, it changes over time. This was the, the whole purpose of the, the, the historical periodization. And you, you can periodize in different ways. The way I periodize it to say that there is some continuity in between the Treaty of Rome and the Treaty of Maastricht, with Maastricht or uh, the Single European Act indeed preempts uh, some of these changes. There are discontinuities, which was also explicitly um, uh, my point um, in the, 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 the slide of, on uh, continuities and discontinuities. But there is no doubt that um, the, uh, the, what I call soft authoritarian liberalism, which I explicitly don't use the label neoliberalism. I could do this whole talk without ever once using the label neoliberalism. It's a useful label because I can then contrast the dominant story, which only picks up these kind of restraints on democracy in the neoliberal period, which is usually then identified with Thatcher Reagan. But in fact, we can identify this uh, uh, as a much deeper uh, 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 response. It's not, just, it's not just from and Marcuse. I mean, yes, the, the, the critique is also of a version of center-leftism, but this is where we have to go back to Neumann and not Heller, precisely because Heller also was not pursuing this empowerment of the working class through what Neumann wanted, which was economic. Uh, uh, democracy. In terms of where, where I want to go with it, it's a diagnosis. Uh, it's a diagnosis of the current situation. It's a diagnosis based on the experience of the Euro crisis, based on, yes, the experience of uh, uh, the Brexit. There are, in each domestic context, a very different response. So whether one could pursue a left-wing project of exit varies from country to country. You have to make good concrete sense of the, the national differences, the cultural differences, the economic differences, the constitutional differences. So this isn't a prescription uh, for anything other than to take seriously the depths of the problem. Uh, far from trivializing them, I want to take them much more seriously, I think, than you do. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm afraid we need to speed up. I have 10 people on the list already who want to <laughs> ask uh, questions. Uh, if you have a co-presentation, not a question, then, then try to make it very, very short, please. Also, and also the answer, try to make it, uh, try to make it short, please. I'm afraid we will not have time really to nail down all the, all the problems and solve them to the, to the end. But next on the list are William Scheuermann and John Keane. William, yours first. Yes, I'll be very brief. So Len Mudesen, I heard um, two different professors. I heard at least two different Professor Mullisons, right? I heard an international lawyer who wants us to take global pluralism seriously, good international lawyer, very sober, right? And then I heard international realism, right? So this soft spot for the balance of power, 
the Congress of Vienna, my goodness, what would that mean today? The US, China, Russia ruling the planet, right? Is what, I mean, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, tragic sense of politics, uh, defense of the nation. I mean, this is old fashioned international realism. So just how those two things fit together. I don't, I don't see how, you know, modern international law fits together, let's say, with this older vision of the balance of power. I mean, I think there's a tension there. I'd love to hear you talk about. Uh, Michael, just very briefly, I, I, you know, I love bringing these texts back into the contemporary debate, but I do think there's a problem. So authoritarian liberalism is a term that emerged in a particular historical and political context. Um, liberalism for us means something very different today, and I think you have to be much more clear about this. I'm just seeing many people jotting down on their computers. Liberalism brings, I mean, you know, so you're, you're making claims about economic liberalism. You need to be more specific about what that means, it seems to me, right? It's, you, you say capitalism, so what specifically? What sort of policies? And what you didn't say, and which, you, of course, you imply, but you need to say this, is authoritarian liberalism means the destruction of everything worthwhile about political liberalism and everything worthwhile about legal liberalism, right? So this is it's not just, I mean, so I think one needs to be, for, I'm, this is the, you're making a political intervention. I'm also making one, because I think this sloppy talk of liberalism, and I think there's been a lot of that. I'm usually not described as a liberal, but I have begun to feel like one in this <laughs> context. We, we need to be very clear about what we're talking about. So. Thank you. Um, Ray, do you want to respond first? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. I. Um. Oh, maybe, shall, uh, shall, we, shall we collect questions? It was, it was quick. Okay. Uh, John Keane, then, please. Um, uh, Michael, um, I'm going to add to your misery because I think that <laughs> um, I worked uh, on the decade of the 1940s, and I think that your Neo Schmittian account of um, authoritarian liberalism, claiming that he was uh, identified with one, you never once mentioned fascism. Heller claims it. I, I think, I think that it. it is in the 40s that we had the last great uh, European centered, Atlantic centered, but also global discussion about the future of democracy. And I think what's missing from your account is the way that in that decade, from right to left, uh, the specter that haunted all so-named Democrats was the evils of arbitrary power, the experience of two global wars, of totalitarianism, etc. And it is in that decade, um, there is no good book written on it, uh, there was the claim that here on, democracy can no longer mean periodic free and fair elections. It must mean something much more and out of that uh, laboratory, so to say, of that decade, which you've airbrushed, was the Friedrich Ambedkar idea that here on democracy should be restrained by written constitutions and independent judiciaries, the importance of civil society, of civil rights, of free trade unions, of a free media. Mitbestimmung is a product of the 1940s. Uh, it's an attempt to prevent uh, one uh, institutional attempt to prevent um, fascism again, and so on and so forth. You've airbrushed that period, and it does seem to me that it needs to uh, be taken into account because it is arguably in that decade that um, we could retrieve the spirit, the language, the, the power-checking dynamics of democracy, a lot can be learned from that, and you've airbrushed it because you simply say that it was the triumph of authoritarian liberalism. The second remark is to everybody. Um, I live in the China zone, and I've so far thought and felt that the unit of analysis of populism is the territorial state. And I could, I could be uh, angry um, nobody has gotten angry so far, although we're getting close to it, uh, <laughs> to say that you Europeans uh, are, have been so far silent about empire, the category of empire. And here is an interesting, uh, I stop on this, um, potential PhD thesis for uh, all the young people here. Um, I think it's striking that we're living in times in which former empires who are again fantasizing a return to imperial glory um, and an empire on the rise, China, 
that each of them is marked by populist qualities. That's true for Erdogan, it's true for Putin, it's true for Johnson and the Brexiteers, it's true for Xi Jinping, and of course, uh, it applies to the United States, where the panic attack uh, that is going on about the decline of the American empire manifests itself in the form of a populism that wants to make it great again. Uh, and as, um, um, as the former German foreign minister said last sentence, uh, one of the long-term consequences of making America great again is that uh, it will make China great again. Um, the point here is that empire, meaning a type of powerful state whose power goes beyond its borders economically, politically, diplomatically, culturally. You know, it was a feature of European modern history. It's not so far been mentioned. And I think uh, the category is important for unlocking, so to say, uh, something about this phenomenon of populism, which has to do with the ressentiment, um, the anger, uh, being pissed off about the loss of empire. Uh, you cannot understand Brexit uh, without understanding that it's an English phenomenon which greatly fills the Scots with, with anxiety. Thank you, Stephen. Well, um, it's certainly not surprising <laughs> that I too have a question for Michael Wilkinson. Um, I, <laughs> and, and one uh, for uh, Jean-François Cavrigan. I, my question re refers to your uh, historical narrative. Um, you know, you remember, may remember that I uh, presented pretty much an op uh, opposite uh, uh, thesis yesterday. I think, whereas you are in fact wanted to speak about authoritarian economic liberalism, you presented mostly, Eucken was an exception, uh, authors from political and legal liberalism. And this is a mixture that confuses your argument. I readily agree that Carl Schmitt is authoritarian, but in no sense is he liberal in a political or legal sense. He, in the uh, Weimar methodological debate, he criticizes all liberal political institutions from parliament uh, to individual rights we, which he wants to diminish to something like a, a façon nulle, uh, to quote Montesquieu. I, I actually, I listened to your speech. I, will, I, I liked the way you presented things, but you mixed up uh, and reduced the liberal argument. You didn't present Lorenz von Stein, for example. You didn't speak about Otto von Gierke. Uh, all scholars, liberal scholars, social democratic scholars, who wanted to empower the people, who wanted to take into account the social question. And present, I think your argument relies on presenting uh, Carl Schmidt as a liberal, which he isn't. He's authoritarian. He's a conservative authoritarian who refers to the conservative Spanish uh, uh, author, Catholic authoritarians. So he, you cannot blame political liberalism for the failures of an authoritarian economic liberalism. And uh, François Carvigon, I, I would be very interested in the, in the second part of your paper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you cannot present it here and now, um, but uh, let, let me hypothetically, uh, hypothetically uh, put a question on, on the second part. Is the differentiation a term differenti differentiated enough to cover the specific development of pop populism and distinguish it from uh, the decay of democracy in the Third Reich, which was also a form of de-differentiation. Okay. Thank you. We have collected three questions now. Uh, before we move on, let me, uh, let me tell you who are the askers of next three questions, if we, if we get there. Now it depends on the, how short the panel, panel will be. Uh, the lady here in the, in the first row, then uh, uh, Paulina Espeo there, and then Yves Beni. And uh, so these will be the next three questions. They'll, and there are, the next three are also form, formed already. So 
please keep that in mind when you uh, ask or prepare new questions or answer questions. Thank you. But let's start from uh, from Rain Millerson here. Yeah. Oh. So the question was, uh, how can I combine? Uh, sorry, how can I combine international law and real political, uh, uh, old-fashioned uh, realism? Uh, yeah, I believe quite well uh, uh, because international law uh, has always been, since its emergence, based on the balance of power. Uh, Emeric de Vattel, uh, Oppenheim, and so on, they all wrote that without equilibrium or without balance, there is no international uh, law. Uh, so, and uh, uh, what, what kind of balance uh, is there possible? It is re uh, reflected also not so well anymore in uh, the uh, UN Charter, uh, in, uh, which is about uh, the, uh, Secretary the UN Security Council and its veto, uh, 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 veto power of five permanent members and so on. Of course, it, there is need to uh, change it, but it is based on the balance of power, so, which existed in 1945. It has changed, uh, and, uh, but it, this balance uh, was uh, not very well, but nevertheless existed also during the Cold War between the Soviet Union and between, uh, the United States, basically, and their respective allies. And uh, 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 it, uh, the, this put limits uh, to uh, the, U, uh, the Soviet expansionism in uh, Europe and the U.S. Uh, uh, expansionism uh, also in different parts of the, uh, the world, uh, but not so well. Uh, this, uh, let's say, bipolar world, uh, uh, this is uh, not so uh, good for international uh, uh, law. Uh, and when the balance was uh, uh, broken by Napoleon, uh, uh, so the Europeans, uh, they restored this balance, and it was expressly reflected in uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the treaties uh, 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 after, uh, 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 which existed uh, or came out from the Vienna Congress of 1815. And uh, now it, what happened in the 1990s, there was no balance anymore. So there was one superpower and its allies, and international law was moving towards, I would call, imperial uh, uh, law. With its, uh, 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 the uh, sovereignty of states is not any more sacrosanct. Uh, the, uh, the concept of internal affairs, this is an outdated uh, one. The right to uh, humanitarian uh, intervention, uh, the droit uh, de uh, even, and uh, uh, so on. Uh, th this, and especially what minor thing, uh, the, the rise of international criminal jurisdiction, which uh, 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 people were very enthusiastic about the creation of in uh, international criminal tribunals and international criminal uh, court, but uh, <coughs> this this. Uh, uh, is not uh, what international law is about. Uh, international law uh, is based on compromises between uh, states. And of course, uh, you may uh, say that uh, minor states like Estonia have no place here. But what is the alternative? You know, uh, I believe, uh, and uh, let's say my predecessor, I was a chair of international law at King's College, uh, uh, Professor Twist, it was in uh, uh, many, many uh, decades before uh, me, he wrote about this problem that the balance of uh, power um, uh, even uh, uh, helps uh, to uh, uh, or supports independence of smaller uh, states. For example, if one big power wants to grab a smaller one, other big powers come together and uh, uh, prevent uh, doing it. So I don't think that there is any realistic alternative to international law based on the balance of power. Uh, the, uh, there is, uh, an, uh, uh, 
imperial power can emerge, of course, but not in the whole world. There may be uh, or empires, uh, 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 let's say, like uh, the British Empire, which was very uh, a big one, uh, but all, uh, nevertheless, uh, it didn't cover the whole uh, uh, planet. Uh, and uh, there can't be, let's say, uh, one uh, single center which would uh, rule uh, the whole world. And therefore we can see uh, always there have, uh, have arisen uh, 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 balances who uh, 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 start to restrict uh, their rising uh, uh, power. So uh, th this is my answer, and I believe political realism is not an outdated uh, concept in my uh, opinion, but uh, 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 it has to be modified probably, uh, but nevertheless it is ba uh, basis also of international law. Thank you. No, Michael? I, I have to go to my slide because, <laughs> I mean, well, from the reaction, uh, I guess I... I must have touched a nerve, I think is the expression. Um, so let me go to the first question. Um, uh, I mean, maybe I should have read through it more slowly. It's possible. <laughs> but I had to go through quite quickly in the interest of getting through the presentation. The established post-war European order always represents a combination of political authoritarianism and economic liberalism. I don't know how it could have been more clearer. Now, yes, we could spend a lot of time talking about precisely what is economic uh, liberalism. Yes, so depolitization of the spheres, if we wanted to define it in conceptual terms, would be key. That takes place through a variety of forms, including the legal form, including the technocratic form, including other forms of de-democratization. Now, the second point, um, the, uh, the so-called airbrushing of the 1940s. I mean, I take that point, it's an important one. However, the diagnosis that uh, Heller gives of authoritarian liberalism includes precisely that arbitrary exercise of power before fascism. It's the presidential regimes under Hindenburg which rule by dicta and decree bypassing parliament, violating legality. This is the debates on the guardian of the constitution between Kelsen and Schmidt. This is already occurring. Now, absolutely, the, the, the decade, the 40s, I mean, sure. It's, it, it's in many ways, if, well, if Polanyi is right, it's this that lays the ground for fascism. Polanyi is clear. It's the market order, ultimately, which is responsible for uh, the, the, the later um, turn. As to Schmidt um, being a liberal, I did, I did say that's an unorthodox interpretation, but it's one that is uh, uh, very, very well documented in the literature, his economic liberalism. If you look at, the, well, you only need to read the whole book. This is the book by Renato Christie, published in 1998, Carl Schmitt and Authoritarian Liberalism, and he annexes to the end of the book the, the speech that Schmitt gives in 1932. This is when Schmitt is still more or less defending the Weimar Constitution before the Nazis come to power. Schmitt is opportunistic. He moves very quickly from one position to the next. And in this speech, it's very clear that for, for Schmitt, the enemy are those on the left that want to democratize the economy. Now, I will uh, finish by saying, yes, that is not an obvious prognosis. How do we democratize the economy is a key question and one which I don't have an easy answer to. I think there are a, 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 a number of works in, in, in political economy which are moving towards that direction. Um, and that's why I finished with, with Danny Roderick, because if his diagnosis of populism is correct, the antidote is more democracy, is further democracy, is democratization precisely of the kind that Neumann and others wanted to pursue in the interwar period. Does that mean uh, 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 maintaining protections of the rule of law? For Neumann, you could do that within that liberal, liberal legal regime, if that is what concerns you. Um, um, I have a question mark over that, but I will leave it there. Thanks. Thank you. To answer uh, your question, Stefan, I can try to explain a little what I call the de de differentiation. Um, so, a phenomenon of uh, all modern societies was, or is, but was, a differentiation of 
social subsystems. Each of those systems has had a specific mode of coding language. For example, you cannot stay uh, for a court in a court and say, I'm right because God is on my side. Uh, it's a different system. <laughs> Religion is a different system of system of law. Now I, gi I can give a good example of what I call de-differentiation. Uh, some months ago, the French President Macron criticized the Brazilian management of fires in Amazonas. It was maybe. Uh, inopportune or I don't, no matter. Bolsonaro, President Bolsonaro gave uh, an answer to Macron with two arguments. First argument, um, env environmental politics is a, a question of sovereignty, uh, is a national question. Okay, this kind of argument is typically a classical political argument, true or false, but it is a political argument. Second argument, you, you, were, you were wrong because my wife is more beautiful as yours. <laughs> uh, some uh, some uh, Brazilian newspapers and politician uh, objects it. You cannot <laughs> say <laughs> such a thing. And Bolsonaro answers, why? She said, <laughs> it is not true. <laughs> She's really more beautiful. <laughs> okay, we can say Bolsonaro is uh, vulgar, uh, uneducated, etc., etc. But I, I think this kind of answer is a symptom of what I call de-differentiation. For Bolsonaro, there is no difference of uh, languages. Uh, uh, to say that my wife is more beautiful as yours is an argument. And why not? And <laughs> My in my opinion, of course it is a ridiculous argument, but in my opinion, this is a, a symptom of a phenomenon, a more legible phenomenon. Uh, it means we can use an argument, or I can see uh, God is on my side, why not? Uh, then f France is, uh, France is uh, uh, the oldest, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, daughter, daughter of the of the of the church, etc., etc. If we if you if we can use such kind of arguments, it means that social differentiation had no more sense. And I my my idea is that is maybe. Uh, a source of the credibility of uh, populist uh, rhetorics today. And of course, in this case, what we called before democracy is in great danger. Um, first, I actually wanted also to react to uh, your um, theory of de-differentiation. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, to the uh, theory of de-differentiation. I think it's absolutely brilliant idea. And um, uh, I, I wouldn't say that populism is kind of the effect of de-differentiation, but it's definitely a driver of de-differentiation, as this example of Bolsonaro showed. Uh, but what, what I also what it got me thinking about is that we've been talking a lot about the uh, opposition between liberalism and populism here, but uh, I think Luhmann's theory actually shows how uh, populism is kind of obstructing conservatism 
because Luhmann's theory of systems is, is very much a, cons a kind of conservative theory that everyone has their place. I mean, uh, academic rhetoric should stay in the auditorium or, or in research journals. Uh, uh, legal rhetoric should stay in the courtroom, uh, medicinal terms in the uh, doctor's office and not go on a media ties, etc. So I would say that actually populism is also kind of a reaction to conservatism, uh, not just its kind of driving force. But to uh, uh, react to John's question about uh, whether the territorial space is the only uh, space for populism, I very much agree that it kind of spans beyond. Uh, I tried to show that it can sp uh, kind of span within uh, transnational spaces, although all of my examples had to do with national politics, like national elections, elections in Turkey, elections in Germany, in Estonia, in Finland, etc. Um, I, I find the idea of the empire very intriguing. We can actually see this also in the way uh, how countries reach out to their diasporas. I think Hungary is a very particular case who extended uh, kind of more voting rights to uh, Hungarians abroad. Uh, not all Hungarians abroad, but those living in the old greater Hungary, for instance. Szabolcs Bogoni has a very good book about ex uh, ex ex territorial citizenship. And I feel that, in a way, the AKP is doing something similar as well. It's also using its diaspora as kind of to manipulate uh, its relationship to, um, uh, to uh, Germany and, and uh, also to show itself as, as more than just a territorial state having equal-based international relations with another state, but actually showing that, you know, <laughs> there is a little Turkey in Germany and they are trying to use this to their advantage. And um, your question got me also thinking about the empire not in traditional terms, that there is the center and then, you know, the borderlands and, and controlling all of that. But there is also something to it in the Hart and Negri's um, approach to the empire. Uh, again, in Estonia, we have a lot of this kind of discourse recently that um, the, uh, th these new populist politicians are ahead of their time. They are singing the anthem to like the future empire, basically, or the future new world order, so to say, where you know Trump is the center and, and kind of controls everything also on, on kind of a discursive level, not just um, you know where people are and, and, and how they can affect uh, politics on, on rational terms. Thank you. Uh, now we have exhausted our time and I'm looking at the, at the organizers with a question in mind. I, I feel the debate is heated and interesting enough that we can take three more questions at, at least. Is that right? Uh, let me do that then. Uh, the lady here, please. Um, my question goes to Professor Marilis. Um, you said while you were presenting that um, transnational populism does not focus on the whole world, but on um, a set of um, immigrants in a specific location. I don't know if I am correct on that, but I would want you to like, um, shed some more light on that. Thank you, I'm collecting more questions. Professor Paulina uh, Espeo. Yes, to... Please take the mic, it, it's coming. Uh, this question, is it on? Yes. yes. This question is similar to the one just asked. I asked it in person to Professor Jacobson, but I want to, uh, everybody to hear it. You talk about transnational populism, um, but it seems like you're more talking about the diaspora. You're talking about the Mexicans abroad or the Turks abroad or the Estonians abroad. But shouldn't a transnational populism be talking about transnational people? If that were the case, it sounds more like uh, the downtrodden from below throughout the world against the, the economic elites throughout the world. And I was wondering if there's a, 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 an answer to that. And, and the other one is a comment for Professor Wilkinson. I like your political intervention, but I worry that it ends up being oddly conservative. You, you ended up by saying, there's nothing to do, very much like the neoliberals in the sense that, you know, there's nothing to go from here. So if you haven't actually um, given the copies to the press, I encourage you to tell us where do we go after the revolution, if we're going to have a revolution, because you don't seem to be saying that we should have it. 
So um, what I would encourage uh, you is to look at those institutions that already exist and the things that we are doing already. There are, no, there are cooperative, non-capitalist institutions and organizations that are already having lots of things taking place around you, and we have a causes to fight for. Um, your book cannot end without mentioning climate change and immigration, and I hope that it does not end by just saying, there's nothing to do, let's go home. Thank you, Professor Yves Meni. Please wait for the mic, it's on the way. More than a question, it's a footnote in the debate between Michael and, and Massimo. Uh, Massimo is right when he, he underlines that order liberalism went, were not on the table in, at the beginning of the European construction. But I would like uh, to remind that there has been a big change which has not really perceived at the time, let's say, in the 55, 58 period during the negotiations of, of the Rome Treaty. There is a big difference between the Rome Treaty and the Coal and Steel Treaty. The Coal and Steel Treaty was linking in a rather f forceful way economic issues and social treatment of economic issues. So social issues were not that differentiated from, let's say, uh, the economic consequences, the negative economic consequences of a given policy. The French delegation in the Rome Treaty tried to introduce, say, social policies, probably for very bad reasons. That is not, not because they had a grand project of European construction, but they were fearful of the German competition. The French requirements were dropped except for one thing. That is, equality of pay between men and women. It's the only thing which has survived from this negotiation. And actually, the Rome Treaty is the beginning of the illustration of Peter Mayer says this. That is, this disjunction between politics and policies. So the Treaty of Rome, from this point of view, uh, show its, uh, demonstrated its consequences, in particular after the single act, and you are right, Massimo, but the worm was in the fruit already in 58, at the time of the Rome Treaty. Thank you. Now I will let Marie-Lise to answer her questions. Yeah, thank you for uh, excellent questions. Um, what I meant by populism becoming transnational instead of global is that, um, well, I, I'm heavily skeptical about uh, this kind of the globalist understanding that uh, globalization makes the world homogeneous. So as also with these examples from very different countries, we see that there is a kind of a similar mechanism behind it, but still the output is very different. So I'm not trying to claim that the whole world is becoming populist, even though this, uh, the empire <laughs> logic in, in some politicians' rhetoric kind of uh, lets you assume that, uh, but still it has kind of its own particularities. And, and this actually relates also to what uh, uh, Professor Ochoa Espejo was uh, asking about. Um, Yes, there is uh, some literature on transnational populism which looks at the uh, transnational people in the way that you describe, that it's the people of, uh, the workers of the world unite uh, in those terms, that the people are kind of um, unified regardless of their ethnicity, nation, historical background, etc. Uh, and there are indeed some works on this, but uh, I would say that this uh, literature I would like to claim <laughs> that this literature is maybe a bit more limited than uh, my uh, approach uh, uh, coming from uh, you know, transnational migration theory, uh, as we can only see examples of this on the uh, populist left. And I would also say that they haven't been very successful examples. So there are examples of trying to kind of export the Movimento Cinque Stelle, there is the DM25, there are the Indignados movements, etc. But actually they also have not kind of spread beyond 
very particular geographic locations and, and in general being less successful than the AKP in, in, in Germany or, or in the Netherlands. So I would just, uh, I would advertise my case as having more kind of empirical resonance at the moment. Although I, I do not negate that you can also construct the people uh, in those terms of those, the, the downtrodden, uh, you know, across the world. Thank you. Uh, do, you do you want to respond as well? Sure. Um, is the microphone working? Yes. Yeah, so th thanks, thanks very much, Paulina. Um, you got, you got the, uh, the pessimism of the intellect part of the presentation. I need to, to work on the optimism of the will part. But um, it, it's, it's not made explicit, you're right. And I should make more explicit that we can't simply go home. Uh, I, I, I agree. And I, I hint at it. Uh, in these ideas of more democratization. So what the solution I think clearly can't be is to double down on the authoritarianism of the, the liberal side um, uh, against populism. This will only ferment more and more uh, conflict. If I were a liberal, I would uh, want to think really carefully about that and try to repair the kind of disconnects, uh, the democratic disconnects that have been, uh, 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 have evolved over the last uh, uh, decades. So, I, but I do thank you for reminding me to end on a, a more optimistic note uh, next time. Um, Eve, thanks for this uh, clarification, which is, uh, I think, a very important one. Uh, that the the 1950s uh, was a much um, more mixed set of uh, uh, factors, including corporatism, social social market economy, which was the adjunct to Order liberalism at that time. Order liberalism wasn't more of a domestic affair. Um, it's quite right, um, but as you uh, as you also nicely pointed out, in a sense, the the foundations are laid. They become more uh, 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 dominant later on, through in part through the, the European Court of Justice. And if we take, for example, the case of Cassis, which is true, only arrives in 1979, but the prelude to that is already Van Gent on Loos and Costa versus Enel, cases which go back to the late 1950s and the early 1960s. So yes, we find the seeds, they mature. And could they have matured in different ways? Quite uh, possibly, of course we will, we will never know. But I think identifying the forces, the logics that meant they would develop in the way that they did is an important exercise. And this, this is where I think the, uh, uh, the, the, the terminology of a soft authoritarian liberalism comes in handy because it captures this diversity of, uh, 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 of solutions. Yes, some from the center left, some from the center right. Mixed, econo mixed economic structures um, um, uh, as well as more uh, uh, hard, hardened forms of uh, uh, liberal order. Um, so, yeah, to, I think as, as uh, Marx put it, to understand the ape, you look at the man. You look at what it's become. <laughs> of course, only with the benefit of uh, hindsight. But um, as I wanted to show, <coughs> th there was some acknowledgement of this already, uh, uh, limited acknowledgement already at the time. Thanks. Thank you. Professor Millerson. Very uh, shortly about empire. Very shortly about empires. Uh, of course, the time of empires, formal empires, uh, is over. But uh, really, in my opinion, informal empires uh, they uh, may uh, exist. Uh, so there is center, and which. Uh, influences uh, the uh, periphery. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, in uh, that respect, of course, uh, if we take globally, not uh, regionally, in the uh, 1990s emerged only one uh, empire, the United uh, States. Uh, and especially we, we see that uh, 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 NATO became an extension of uh, uh, the U.S. empire uh, in uh, Europe. And of course, uh, this uh, uh, 
uh, caused a counter reaction uh, uh, from first from the uh, <coughs> part of uh, uh, Russia, uh, then uh, uh, from the part of China, because NATO now uh, uh, tries to uh, prevent uh, China become also uh, more uh, and more powerful. This is, from my point of view, uh, uh, very uh, uh, stupid for the part of Europeans uh, to, uh, to take up this uh, idea that NATO should be used not only against Russia but also against uh, China. This will uh, uh, bring together more and more China and Russia against and other maybe other states against uh, the U.S. hegemony and uh, will shorten it uh, even uh, more. Thank you. Uh, I have six more people with questions on the list, but now I'm afraid I have to execute my non-democratic power as a chair of this session uh, to, to end this session. In, uh, and that's a pragmatic argument if a, in favor of the lunchtime. Please take your questions there. And thanks again for panelists. <laughs>